Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Extreme Jeans. Extreme Jeans. Uh, I met your grandma, Big Sloppin', in 46. Oh, every Christmas, we'd visit my Uncle Fred in prison. And you have found us, America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. My name is Fisher. I am your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. This segment is brought to you by FamilySearch.org. Welcome to the show. Great to have you. And uh, my guest today... Two very interesting ladies, Brianne Kirkpatrick. She is a genetic counselor out of Virginia and perhaps the only person in the country who actually counsels with people who have gotten unusual results from their DNA matches. They find out their father isn't their father or their grandmother or grandfather wasn't the whatever it might be. But a lot of people are dealing with the shock of a discovery. You know, they send in their DNA sample to find out if they were 53 percent Irish or whatever. And then they learn something like that, and they're coping with it. And Brianne is working with these people, setting up Facebook pages and and support groups. And it'll be really fascinating to hear what she has to say, because it's often said in the genealogy world these days that we just don't have enough people to help with these surprise DNA results. So that'll be coming up in about 10 minutes. Later on in the show, Melissa Barker is back. She is the archive lady in Houston County, Tennessee, and she's uncovered some amazing stories stories and found some great new things, kind of typical of what you might find in your local county archive or in the archive that might house some of the artifacts of your ancestors. So you're going to want to hear what Melissa has to say later on in the show. Hey, just a reminder, by the way, sign up for our weekly Genie newsletter. I know you've been thinking about it. You don't have to think any longer. It doesn't cost you anything. Just go to ExtremeGenes.com, get signed up right there, or go to our Facebook page and get that taken care of. We've got all kinds of great stories there and, of course, links to to other stories of interest for anybody who's doing their family history research. All right, off to Boston right now for the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. I hear him rattling his papers right now. It's David Allen Lambert. How are you, David? You know me. I've got to get my paperwork in order if I'm going to give the family history on news. To that is correct, sir. And we have uh, quite a bit of it today. Let's get started. What do you have? Well, I do. In fact, I hope that after FGS, I've got some more news to give to our listeners. I'm looking forward to seeing you very shortly this week at the Federation of Genealogical Societies Conference out in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Yes, indeed. Well, my first one is kind of a bittersweet thing for genealogy. It's actually 10,000 slave deeds, bills of sale from over 26 counties in North Carolina that are being digitized. These records tracing the story of slavery in North Carolina are being digitized by the University of North Carolina in Greensboro and may, in fact, unlock the stories for some of our listeners' ancestors. Yes, and this is a great thing. 10,000 of them, that's a big deal. It really is. And the ideal thing is that you never know what clue you may find that may unlock it in the record. And they're covering 26 counties in this project as well. So this is going to be a very big boon for people looking for slave research in North Carolina. Absolutely. Well, my next story goes back to World War I, where an Irishman by the name of Corporal Martin J. Cunningham will finally get a place of honor and a gravestone. Martin died in World War I on July 22, 1918, was originally buried over in France. His body was sent back to Chicago, where he was buried again in Mount Olivet Cemetery, buried by the railroad tracks. Not a proper burial, not a proper military funeral, and not even a gravestone. But this has all changed a century later. Yeah, isn't that great? Here's an Irishman fighting for the United States, dies over there in France, brought back to Chicago because he lived there briefly with his sister, and now he's finally getting his proper recognition exactly 100 years after his death. That's about time. Well, our story next goes to World War II, and this deals with a young 17-year-old Canadian whose death was a mystery for over 75 years until a German research team led by Eric Wyman went out and they were tracking down the former wrecks of aircraft in World War II in Germany. They found where this young man had perished. Identification was made, and now a proper funeral is held in Germany, and he is now buried with his name associated with him. Isn't that amazing? He goes and he's fighting against Germany. Germans find him, and Germans honor him with this ceremony and marker. 
Well, you know, 75 years is a long time, and a lot of wounds have been healed, and it's nice to see that such things are done maybe 100 years ago or yep. 75 years ago. That's right. Well, you know, I really dig old libraries, Fish, and <laughs> we're going to be out at the Allen County Public Library real soon, but this is an even older one, even older than any HGS in Boston. Out in Cologne, Germany, while they were doing some construction recently, they actually uncovered a Roman building that they originally thought was a, I don't know, a community hall, until they found niches in the walls. These niches, they believe, held over 20,000 scrolls. They found a library, one of the oldest known libraries dating probably from the first century A.D. This Roman library doesn't have the scrolls anymore, but the foundation is there, and it's over 30 feet high and 65 feet long. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Scrolls. And just think if the scrolls survived, what stories and genealogy they would have uncovered for people. Sure. Yeah. Family Search has put together a brand new database in conjunction with the Ellis Island Foundation. This covers all the passengers arriving through Ellis Island between 1820 and 1957. And of course, the earlier ones are Castle Garden yeah. that cover 1820 to 1891. So this is great. It catches also at the tail end of it. People are coming in in commercial airlines. So a pretty wide swath of years. That's right. Very broad. And uh, I have a few that came in on that time. I did find that database the other day out of the blue and went, oh, this looks good. My next story is my blogger spotlight. And this week it shines upon Lara Diamond. Lara's genealogy is reachable at Lara's genealogy dot blogspot dot com. And Lara's genealogy is about Jewish genealogy. She actually just came back from the International Jewish Genealogical Society Conference in Warsaw, Poland. Her blog deals with Jewish genealogy and her own personal ancestral research. And it's a really interesting view into Jewish genealogy if you have had any inquiry into your own family tree. Very nice. All right. Thank you so much, David. And we'll see you soon at FGS this coming week. All right. Yep. And knock them dead on that keynote, pal. See you soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. And coming up next, we're going to talk to Brianne Kirkpatrick. She's in Virginia. She's a genetic counselor working with a lot of people who get surprise DNA results. You're going to want to hear what she has to say about how she helps them get through the shock on occasion. Coming up next in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Legacy Tree Genealogist is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've worked with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll free at 1-800-818-1476 or register online to get a free estimate. Right now, you can save up to $100 on professional genealogy research. But hurry, this offer expires at the end of the month. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. Settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. 
Hey, Genies, Fisher here with a shout out to our Patrons Club members at patreon.com slash extreme genes. This is where friends of the show support extreme genes for as little as a dollar a month, all the way up to the cost of a very nice burger each month. I mean, a really juicy one. You can support the show and enjoy various special Patrons Club member benefits, such as acknowledgement on extremegenes.com, special bonus podcasts from expert guests like Maureen Taylor, the photo detective, C.C. Moore, your genetic genealogist, great storytellers and experts on record sets from all over the world. We even offer expert advice on specific questions challenging your research. So go to patreon.com slash extreme genes and get signed up. We love sharing your genealogical journey with you on our Extreme Genes Patrons Club. After all, what would you rather have, inspiring and informative content or another greasy burger? The choice is yours. And thanks for supporting Extreme Genes. Hey, welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And this segment is brought to you by Legacy Tree Genealogists, LegacyTree.com. And I, I, I tell you, there's a lot of conversation in the genealogy space these days about the need for genetic counseling. And that's because so many people are discovering, well, the unexpected when they do a DNA test. As I've mentioned on the show before, I had that happen for somebody I was helping back in July of 2017. And as we went through her DNA matches, I had to break the word to her after about 20 minutes that her father was not her father. And dad and mom were both long gone. She was a middle child of uh, six. She was third or fourth, somewhere in there. And it's been a tough road for her since that day. And it's been uh, well over a year now, and she's still dealing with it. And wouldn't you know, there was an article recently in The Atlantic about Facebook groups and counselors working with people who have this same kind of result. And there are many of them out there. They all feel pretty much alone. And I tracked down one of these genetic counselors who's on the line with me right now. She's with WatershedDNA.com. Brianne Kirkpatrick in Virginia. How are you, Brianne? Welcome to Extreme Genes. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. When did you start noticing cases coming in? Because you've been a counselor for many years. When did you start noticing cases? Your first one that came in and said, oh, my gosh, I found out dad wasn't dad or mom wasn't mom or I was adopted or something like this. And then when did you start to realize, oh, wait a minute, this is a much bigger thing than I imagined? Yeah, that's a great question. It's been probably um, about four years ago, and I've been a genetic counselor for over 13 years, and I actually got into genealogy as a personal hobby for my own family, and that was around 2013-14 when I did my first DNA test for genealogy purposes and had a couple other people in my family, and as I was getting involved in the genealogy community, people found out, oh, there's a genetic counselor here now, and I started getting emails and messages and people asking if I could help them, and they would explain their situation, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is exactly, you know, you come to the right person, genetic counselors, you know, our background is mainly in medical genetics, but we have also training and counseling skills and helping connect people to support groups and finding other people like themselves, and I realized back then, and that was before we saw this explosion of the popular consumer tests like Ancestry DNA and 23andMe, but I saw that this was coming. And I wanted to be able to be available for people who had questions or were just in a spot where they needed support and were upset or confused or just needed, you know, somebody who knew this stuff that could help answer questions for them and point them in the right direction. So I'd say it's been, um, you know, probably four years or so. And just in the past six months or so, it's become more obvious just how many people get DNA surprises. We've seen articles come out in the popular press. We've seen TV shows about it. And so now some of those surprises are getting talked about. I have a blog on my watershedDNA.com website, and I've started having people do guest blog posts where they talk about their own experience with the DNA surprise where they are, how that's affected them emotionally, and things like that. It's amazing to watch, isn't it? I mean, there are new people every single day now finding that kind of test result. And I think many of these people feel totally lonely that they're the only one this could happen to. How could this happen to me? I mean, the questions that you must hear as you speak to some of your clients must be pretty endless. 
Exactly. And I try to reassure them that they're not alone and they're not the only people who have experienced what they're going through. And I point them to resources like Facebook group. I have a couple that I've started. One of them is specifically for people who've discovered that a parent is not the parents that they were raised with. And they discovered it as a result of testing as an adult. Another group is just in general for people who have a family surprise. Maybe they discovered it for somebody else in their family and they're trying to figure out how do I break the news. And then I'm starting a new group because I've had a couple of spouses reach out to me. So wives whose husbands found out that they had a child that they never knew about. And and that's a different experience. It's still a struggle and emotional challenges, even if you're not directly involved in the surprise. So it's good to see that groups like these, and there are other ones, there's a website, MPE Friends Fellowship, that recently founded, that's a a nonprofit group that was founded by Catherine St. Clair to also connect people who've had these similar surprises. So resources are starting to become available, and at this point, it's just helping people who could benefit from them know that they exist and get them to those places. What would you say was um, one of the most difficult cases, one that you could talk about, obviously, and we don't need any names or anything like that, but what was the situation that sticks in your mind? Yeah, there are a couple that stick in my mind. I'll talk about the one that's happened most recently, just because it's the freshest in my mind, and I, I just put a post up on my website about it today. There was a gentleman who reached out to me who's 78 years old, and he and his children just did 23 and Me for fun. And there was no match, no parent-child match between he and his children. This was really shocking and upsetting. And he confronted his ex-wife about it. And she admitted that there had been some infidelity during the marriage that he was not aware of up until that point in time. And his level of anger was very understandable. And he reached out because he was wondering, you know, can I believe these results? And what should I do now? And there was a lot he was struggling with. The anger was leading him to think of things like filing a lawsuit against his ex-wife. And that were things that I couldn't address with my professional background, but I could point him in the right direction. And I told him about the support groups, and he shared that information with his children, who are now adults. And their whole family is just trying to adjust to this unexpected news that was not anything that they expected going in to do a test, which they said they had done just for fun. Yeah, they were just Um, looking for ethnicity, probably, right? Right, yeah, and really didn't expect anything that would turn their lives upside down and found themselves in this spot where their lives were turned upside down. And they were each dealing with it differently. Each person is going to react to the same information differently. And it also takes a different amount of time for people to get to a different place. And it's really a form of grief that people go through when they get a DNA surprise no matter who they are, how they are affected by that DNA surprise. Boy, I can only imagine. How many genetic counselors that work with DNA results like this do you think are out there at this point? So there are over 4,000 genetic counselors in the United States, but I'm the only one that specialized in ancestry testing in this specific type of situation. I'm hoping that over time there will be more genetic counselors that develop an interest and are available for these similar kinds of referrals. Right now it's me, and and about half of what I do is still medical-related. So I still am involved in a medical genetic testing world. I help people pick a test and identify, you know, based on what they're looking for, which is the right test for you, and then after the fact, help them understand their results. And then half of what I do is supporting emotional needs, no matter the type of DNA test they have. So right now it's just me, and I don't know how the future will look, but I do know that there is growing interest within my profession to see genetics not just only affecting medical issues, but every aspect of people's lives. Do you think there's any way to prepare people better? I mean, I understand there are warnings. You know, we get that on all the tests. And a lot of people say, well, they're not large enough. They don't promote them enough, that type of thing. Do you think there's anything the companies could do to better prepare people for the possibility? So I do think there are things that could be available. And whether people decide to take them up or not, it's going to be individual. Because no one really thinks that this is going to happen to them until it does. And so no matter how many warning boxes you put up and how many check boxes people have to click through, they're really not going to pay much attention to it if they don't think it applies to them at all. But part of what genetic counselors do is called pre-test genetic counseling, 
where we talk about all the scenarios, all of the what ifs. Here's all the potentials that could come from this testing. What if this happens to you? Do you know where you'll turn for support? Are you aware that these resources are available? Let's think about how before you do the testing and your test comes back, let's make sure that you're ready no matter what comes. So that is a service that I offer that not too many people take up just because I don't think a lot of people think they need help until after the fact. Yeah, So right. um, in terms of what the companies can do, talk more about genetic counseling, what genetic counselors do, and the benefits of doing a, a more official form consent process before the test is ever ordered. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. How long would you say, on average, and I understand every individual is totally different, but based on the average case where basically somebody finds out, oh, dad wasn't dad, does it take them to adjust to that new normal and get on with their lives? That's an excellent question. And just based on having one of the Facebook groups up and running for over a year now, people pop in and give updates on how things are going. And I would say, you know, most people find it takes anywhere from a couple of months to a year or longer to really feel like they've got their feet on solid ground again. And there's not really a whole lot that can be done except for the passage of time and figuring out that you're not alone and that it's okay to not be okay and that it's okay to be angry and to experience all of those emotions that come with finding out a surprise. And if it takes longer than that or less time than that, then that's okay as well. Nobody's the same, and there's no right time frame on how long someone should struggle or not with this information. That's great insight. She's Brianne Kirkpatrick. She's a genetic counselor in Virginia. You can check out her website at watershedDNA.com. By the way, a very calming website with that cover with the water flowing across. I just keep it on to keep calm throughout the day. And you can read about it in The Atlantic, by the way. The article's on ExtremeGenes.com. Brianne, thanks for your time. It was really interesting, and I'm glad to know that people like you are out there, and I hope we get more like you. Thank you. I appreciate having the opportunity to talk with your audience about this. Yeah, thanks again for having me on today. And coming up next, we're going to talk to Melissa Barker. She is the archive lady in Houston County, Tennessee, and she's got some more finds for us. Things that you might be able to discover in your local archive. That's on the way in five minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks.
Welcome back. It is America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher at this end, talking to Melissa Barker. She is our friend, the archive lady in Houston County, Tennessee. And it's been a while. Melissa, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Scott. How are you doing? Awesome. You know, it's a great summer and so much going on. And I always enjoy talking to you because this is a lady who was basically brought kicking and screaming into the world of archives. She was a genealogist and they needed one in her county. And she said, okay. I'll start this thing. And now she loves it. And she's basically collecting all the things relating to the history of the county. And we love hearing some of the materials that are kind of representative of what you can find in archives in any county in the United States. And you do some great stuff. And I understand recently you kind of picked up on something that I talk about quite a bit on the show. And that is finding items relating to your research on eBay. Yes, I heard your interview on Faces of Next Gen, and it reminded me that as an archivist, I am trolling eBay myself. (laughs) Okay, and you're looking for things for your particular county in Tennessee or families that are prominent there, I would assume, or those that you are at least aware of, and perhaps even some neighboring counties? I do. I set up my alerts on eBay, as you've talked about. Right. And when I get those emails saying there's something new, I go check it out. I kind of put a twist on it, though. I am one of these small county archives that does not have a budget to purchase things on eBay. So what I do is I contact the seller. I explain to them that I understand, you know, you're trying to sell this for a profit. But if it does not sell and you're willing to do this, would you please donate it to the archive so that it could be brought back to where it started? Really? Okay. And you get good response from that? I actually do get good responses for that. We have been able to recover several documents, photographs, and artifacts from these sellers on eBay. They've been extremely generous to be able to do that for us. Wow. What kind of pictures have you gotten? How old? We've gotten pictures from the 1800s uh, for buildings that they knew it was from Houston County, but they didn't know what the buildings were, and they didn't sell, and they were gracious enough to donate them to us. And have you gotten letters or postcards or anything similar to that? We have gotten some envelopes. That's a, that was my first foray into eBay trying to do this. There was a gentleman who was a postage stamp collector, And he was starting to put these envelopes. They're empty envelopes, but they had someone's name on them. And, of course, the postmark I could see was from our area. And I asked him, I said, hey, if it doesn't sell, please donate them. Consider that. And he did. And every time he would put one up for my area, I would ask him the same thing. After two or three times of doing this, he told me, he said, okay, okay, Melissa. He says, don't keep asking me. If I find another one, I'll just send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've gotten 16 envelopes from Miss Mary Carpenter from our area. And they're empty, but they are in her vertical file under the Carpenter surname for any genealogist to find. Isn't that fun? And have you had people from that family connect with some of these things yet? On that particular one, not yet, but I'm hoping that someone who is researching the Carpenter family in the Middle Tennessee area will seek us out, and we will be glad to share these documents with them. Boy, what a great strategy, and I bet you you're one of the very few, if not the only one in the country, is doing something like this for the archive. Are you sharing this strategy with some of your fellow archivists? I am, and I also post on my Facebook page and the Archive Lady Facebook page. I do a Today in the Archive post almost every day, and I always share the finds and the wonderful things that are donated from eBay. Yeah, that's absolutely astounding. The things you can get in family history, obviously it would translate over to what you're doing for your particular county. And what's the biggest thing so far, the one thing that just really gets you excited when you show it to people? Well, I would have to say that the one thing are a couple of original newspapers for our county from 1896. The wonderful thing about this is that these two newspapers had not been microfilmed, which tells me that they were, had not survived when the microfilming process came in and they microfilmed all the newspapers. These evidently were missing. And they were found on eBay, and I asked for them to be donated, and they were. Wow. From a couple of particular days or throughout that year? They were actually two consecutive days in 1896, 
And it was wonderful because I checked the microfilm to see if we even had been microfilmed or saved, and they had not. So that's even better. Yeah, right? Absolutely. Have you ever thought about maybe finding somebody who has quite a passion for the county to maybe buy some things that you can't otherwise get on behalf of the county? I actually have a patron who is actually a fellow archivist, but her family is from the county. And every once in a while, she will purchase something on eBay and send it to me. She won't even tell me. She just throws it in the mail, and I'll get it. (laughs) That is so much fun. All right. Otherwise, now, Melissa, as we always talk about, what are some of the latest stories that you've uncovered for your county through items that are right there in your archive? I actually ran across a fantastic document that actually sent me on a research (laughs) trip. We received some records from the city of Erin, which is our capital city here in Houston County, and there were boxes marked miscellaneous, and of course they were filled with miscellaneous documents and records. But one of the documents was a very interesting petition from citizens of the city of Erin dated October the 4th, 1919. And what these citizens were doing or they were they had, were sending this petition to the State Board of Pardons in Nashville, Tennessee, asking for a parole of a Mr. Morris Dillard. And on the petition it reads, they're asking to release him on parole, we'll meet the approval of our community as we think he has been punished enough for the crime he committed. And after reading that, there's 64 individuals who signed this petition. Oh, that's fun. And it made me wonder, what in the world did this man do? And why did they want him paroled? So I went back into the court records, and I found where on November the 9th, 1916, he was convicted of breaking and entering the business of Mr. J.B. Bunnell. And this is what he stole. He stole $9 in silver five-cent pieces, one pair of trousers, one sweater, one hat, one necktie, one pair of socks, one pair of shoes, and one overcoat. <laughs> he wanted to look all good. Of, he did. And the value of all that at the time was $36.75. And he was sentenced for how long? The sentence was for no less than three years and no more than 10 years in the state penitentiary in Nashville. Wow. That's a long sentence for that. Yes, it was. And he served three years of that. And once the State Board of Pardons received this petition... They released him two weeks later. But the story doesn't end there. The petition, the first person who signed this petition was Mr. J.B. Bunnell, the person he stole from. The victim, number one on the list. And the others on this list are very prominent businessmen. The sheriff signed the petition. One of the jurors who convicted him signed the petition. (laughs) <laughs> really? So, yes. And so I got to looking even further into this, and I found that Mr. Dillard actually moved to Florida in the 1940s, but he would continue to visit Houston County because he had family here. He died November 27th, 1954. He had become a commercial fisherman in Fort Myers Beach, Florida, and he was found floating in the water. Oh, how sad. A sad ending. Yeah. It's so sad ending. They feel like he probably had fallen off the pier. He was brought back to Houston County to be buried. And it's so interesting to look at the pallbearers listed. Two of the pallbearers were ones that signed the petition to get him out of jail. Boy, that's great stuff. And that's a perfect example of what your county archive might have for you about a member of your family. Think of all the signatures on that. Maybe one of somebody's ancestors is going to be found on that list. Great stuff as always, my friend. Thanks so much for coming on, and we look forward to talking to you again sometime soon. Thank you, Scott. It was great talking to you. As always, Melissa Barker, the archive lady on Extreme Genes. Coming up next in three minutes, Tom Perry talking about preserving your precious heirlooms on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Legacy Tree Genealogist is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've worked with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us 
toll free at 1-800-818-1476 or register online to get a free estimate. Right now, you can save up to $100 on professional genealogy research. But hurry, this offer expires at the end of the month. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. Settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. Hey, Genies, Fisher here with a shout out to our Patrons Club members at patreon.com slash extreme genes. This is where friends of the show support extreme genes for as little as a dollar a month, all the way up to the cost of a very nice burger each month. I mean, a really juicy one. You can support the show and enjoy various special Patrons Club member benefits, such as acknowledgement on extremegenes.com, special bonus podcasts from expert guests like Maureen Taylor, the photo detective, C.C. Moore, your genetic genealogist, great storytellers and experts on record sets from all over the world. We even offer expert advice on specific questions challenging your research. So go to patreon.com slash extreme genes and get signed up. We love sharing your genealogical journey with you on our Extreme Genes Patrons Club. After all, what would you rather have, inspiring and informative content or another greasy burger? The choice is yours. And thanks for supporting Extreme Genes. And welcome back. It is America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. This segment is brought to you by LegacyTree.com. Tom Perry is here. He's our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com. Hello, Tommy. Hello. You know, we got a, a great question here from a listener who's asking a question. I think we hear quite a bit, and I know you've run into over many, many years, and it has to do with photographs that have sticky notes on them. Now, I'm not clear from the way she wrote this uh, email whether or not this was an actual sticky note or was this a piece of paper that was glued to it or maybe a piece of paper that got stuck to the finish of the photograph. But she says she's really having a hard time getting it off the top. And there are several of these pictures she's got and she's afraid of doing damage to them. And I just emailed her back and said, you know what? The best thing you could possibly do is Photoshop that thing out. What do you think, Tom? Oh, I totally agree with that. What she's probably referring to is back in the day, they used to have this stuff that was called correction paper, that if you made a mistake in a big, long letter you were typing, you'd put that down and type over it. And the problem is the kind of adhesive they use doesn't stay tacky like today's Post-it notes. And so once it got old, it actually turned into almost like a varnish and permanently adhered itself to the photo. So a lot of things you can do, which we talked about before, you can get the piano wire and try to get it off, moisten it, different things like this. But the thing is, nine out of ten times, by the time you go through all these things, even though it works, you could have done a better job of, like you just mentioned, scanning it at super high DPI, go into Photoshop, and use the cleanup tool, do the merge tool, do the clone tool, and just recreate that part of the photo. And while you're doing that, you can go and do color correction, do all kinds of things at the same time. So like you say, I would just go in and scan it. And even if you say, oh, no, I want to go in and fix the original, 
that's good. But don't forget, always scan it first, just in case there's a whoops, you have it scanned. <laughs> right? The other thing is to keep that original, as damaged as it may be after the fact. But I know a lot of people, they treasure the physical photos over the idea of digitized scans, because I think, to some extent, people are fearful of the technology. People are afraid that it's just too hard. They don't know how to do it. And I will tell you firsthand that, like anything else, you sit down one step at a time, Scanning is pretty easy, and you learn how to do it in different sizes so that you can be sure to get a lot of the detail that you wouldn't get otherwise if you don't do it at a high resolution. And then you go in and just start playing with these tools. And as you mentioned, Tom, you do a save as, so you you keep the original scan, and then you have the one you play with. You want to be able to uh, control Z and undo things that you think aren't just quite up to speed and keep trying to improve it. But it is so much fun to fix a photograph. And I dare say... The only reason you're still in business, Tom, in this day and age is because of people who are afraid of the technology that is so simple. Oh, absolutely. And I really encourage people out there. In fact, I'm a very poor businessman. I tell people all the time when they call and say, hey, I need to ship you this because of da, 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 da. Nine out of ten times I go, well, no, step back. This is probably something you can do yourself. Go and do yada, yada, yada. Because the thing is, most of it's just ignorance. We just don't know that there's a better way to do it. I mean, we still get calls every single day to say, hey, I have an old VHS tape. Is there any way it can be put onto a DVD? And it's like, really? Are, are you serious? Because you think everybody knows that by now, but they don't. A lot of this kind of stuff, I love to teach people how to do it because then they can go and teach their friends, teach their neighbors, teach their church groups or whatever of how to do this themselves. Because I'm not always going to be here, so somebody's got to learn how to do this stuff and do it yourself. And it's so fun to do it yourself. That's why I love doing it. Well, and to a great extent, it's a generational thing. I mean, the reality is, is our kids and our grandkids are coming up in an age where they're totally comfortable with the technology, and they're learning how to do it. They're having fun with it. And I've often scolded some people, especially some seniors, who just say, oh, I can't do this. I said, you got the time. You got the brains. Make it happen. More coming up in three minutes when we return on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Media Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to transferduplication.com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for the Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's Top 10 Tips for Beginning Genealogists from the Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. Hey, 
we're back at it. It's Extreme Genes, America's family history show, and ExtremeGenes.com. My name is Fisher. I am your radio root sleuth, and Tom Perry is our preservation authority. We're talking about this listener email that we had a little bit ago about removing a sticky piece of paper at the top of some photos. And, Tom, you're mentioning these things are what? Yeah, what this paper usually was, back in the day, they had what they called correction tape. Because when you were typing a big, long letter, you couldn't erase it like you do on a computer and then reprint it. Yeah. So you get tape and put over the bad words. But when it gets old, it turns into kind of almost a laminate that becomes hard. It's not sure. tacky anymore like a post-it would be. So that being the case now, this person has gone and Photoshopped it, as we talked about, and hopefully did some great correction on color and fixed some of the damage and maybe even replaced part of the image that was covered by the photograph. Not hard, especially if it's a background thing, because maybe the paper is just at the top and maybe there's just a tree line or something there and with photoshop you can fix those things so easily photoshop elements is great and there are many other programs that are very similar to it but the question would be now okay i got this damaged photograph do i have any use for it anymore because i've got this great image i've created on photoshop of course the answer is yes but where would you suggest they put it then tom how do they store damaged photographs like that We've talked about this since episode one. Never, ever throw away originals, especially something as small as photos that are easy to store. You can get special envelopes. You can get special sheets of paper. You can get all kinds of things that are acid-free, that are good storage devices. So put them between your photographs so there won't be any more damage to them. Because as technology changes, there's going to be technology out in 10, 20 years from now that we can't even imagine. And they might want to go back one of those photographs and do something more magic with it, make it 3D or something. So you never want to ever get rid of anything. I had somebody call me the other day and said, hey, we had our wedding video done years ago. We went and had it put on a DVD. We thought we were happy. We never watched the DVD. We threw the VHS away. We were having a nostalgic moment. We pulled out the DVD, popped it in, and it did not look like the tape. It was really, really bad. And now the tape's gone. Don't throw stuff away. So now they're going to have to find somebody in their family that has original wedding video that they better transfer because they threw the original away. Never, ever throw the original away. And if you're in a situation where storage is a problem and you can't store the stuff, make sure you look at the reproduction and make sure that's good before you ever throw a tape away or a photograph or anything. And also make sure, obviously, that you take the reproduction that you've got or the image that you've created through Photoshop, and you've got it stored in many different places. So if you lose it in one place, you don't lose it in all the places. I mean, that's really the key to this whole thing of preservation, isn't it, Tom? Spread it out, absolutely. That's why we tell people, use two clouds, have it on two different clouds, have it on DVDs, have it on USBs, have it on data disks, have it on your hard drive, and spread around like we talked about on one of our first episodes. We had a couple that had their wedding done. They were living in New Orleans and their parents had a copy. They had a copy. The photographer had a copy. They thought they were all great. They lived miles away from each other. When Katrina came in, unfortunately, all three of them got wiped out and they lost everything. If they would have had friends in Dotham, Alabama, that they could have sent a data disk to, then they could get a hold of them and make a copy. But they lost everything because it wasn't backed up properly. Boy, great advice. All right, thanks so much. And, of course, you can always ask Tom questions at asktom at tmcplace.com or tweet to him at asktomp. All right, Tom, great talking to you, and we'll catch up with you again next week. My pleasure. Hey, that is, once again, our wrap for this week. And thanks to our guest, Brianne Kirkpatrick, who came on today. She's a genetic counselor, and she's filling a very important role right now because she may be the only one in the country right now who's helping counsel people who get unexpected results from their DNA testing. And if you know somebody who's struggling with something related to that, you might want to check out Brianne's website, which is watershedDNA.com. Thanks also to the archive lady, Melissa Bar for talking about some of her strategy for stocking up her archive from eBay. We'll talk to you again next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Family.